Hi everyone, this is Laura Coombs. I'm the director of the Head Injury Institute at the American College of Radiology, and thank you for joining us for the webinar on ordering appropriate imaging for traumatic brain injury. Our presenters today, we have three presenters today, Dr. Max Wintermark, Dr. Pina Sinelli, and Dr. Jenna Lee. Dr. Max Wintermark is a professor of radiology and chief of neuroradiology at Stanford University, and he has expertise in uh, clinical and research expertise in imaging patients with cerebrovascular conditions like stroke and aneurysms, and he's also an expert in CT technology and advanced Im imaging techniques such as perfusion imaging. Uh, Dr. Pina Sinelli is the Vice Chair of Research in the Department of Radiology at North Shore. She is also an Associate Professor of Radiology and Associate Professor of Public Health at Wild Cornell Medical College, and her research interests are focused on technology assessment and outcomes-based research in brain perfusion imaging in patients with cerebrovascular disease. Um, our third speaker is Dr. Jenna Lee. Uh, she's a fellow at Montefiore Medical Center. She received her MD at Columbia University and completed her residency at Albert Einstein uh, Montefiore Medical Center. And below is a list of their disclosures. And our target audience for today is uh, pretty much anyone who's dealing with PBI patients, um, be they emergency room physicians, radiologists, pediatricians, um, you know, other other any PBI caregivers. And what we hope to accomplish today is um, to help you to uh, identify appropriate imaging for TBI patients based on the evidence in the literature and also kind of give you some background or some idea about where the latest research is going and talk about some techniques that are not, um, not in use clinically at this point. So the American College of Radiology, for those of you who aren't familiar with the American College of Radiology, it's a professional society. It was founded in 1923. We have uh, over 30,000 members that include radiologists, medical physicists, interventional radiologists. Um, and we are, our offices, headquarters are located in Reston, Virginia, where, where we are today. But we also have offices in DC, Pennsylvania, and uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, the, the American College College of Radiology has programs in a variety of areas, including quality and safety, research, government relations, education, economics. And one of the projects that we started a couple of years ago was the Head Injury Institute. And um, we've gathered a group of um, real experts in the area of TBI and um, for the purpose of understanding, diagnosing, and, and treating head injuries. And so the, our three speakers today are um, part, part of the part of the ACR Head Injury Institute. So I'm going to pass over now um, to our first speaker. Before I do that, I just want to say that um, we're going to take questions at the end. So we're going to let them go through their presentation. And then you can type in your questions anytime, but, but we'll, um, we'll be answering them at the end. So Dr. Sinelli. Thank you, Laura. Hi, I'm Pina Sinelli. And just trying to advance my slides. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, we'll start with the first slide that I have is, why should you care about traumatic brain injury? The main reason is that TBI has a high incidence affecting American and all age groups. Cumulative statistics from recent data from 2002 to 2006 reported that TBI contributed to 52,000 deaths, 275,000 hospitalizations, and 1,365,000 visits to the emergency department, making TBI a public health concern regarding the health of the population as well as the downstream implications for healthcare delivery and cost. And yet there is a large number of patients that we cannot estimate that do not receive or attend to medical care. More recent data in 2010 has shown that TBI visits to the emergency department hospitalizations, and deaths have risen to 2.5 million, with about 138 deaths each day, estimating overall a 70% increase in the past decade. I'm sure many of you have seen some of the press TBI has been given in the news recently 
focused on the long-term effects seen with TBI in mainly athletes such as football and soccer players and veterans returning from battle conditions. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a delayed long-term effect described as a degenerative disease of the brain thought to be due to repeated injury to the head. The diagnosis and grading of TBI is performed as a multidisciplinary approach, including a detailed history from the patient and or family member, a thorough physical examination, including a neurologic exam that may focus on neurocognitive and neuropsychological testing, as well as imaging. To the right is an image, uh, it's a non-contrast CT of the head in a patient who suffered severe traumatic brain injury. There is extensive acute subarachnoid hemorrhage focused in the supracellar cistern as well as in the sylvian fissures. Other testing that can be performed include laboratory tests such as serum S100B, which is not yet in widespread use, as well as tissue sampling, which is not feasible in the acute emerging care setting. What imaging studies do clinicians order to assess TBI? Well, there is enormous variability in how much and what type of imaging is performed for TBI patients. While decision rule sets have been established, they are neither well known nor widely used at the point of care in the emergent setting. In one study, the rates at which different ED attendings at one institution ordered head CTs for TBI patients ranged from 7 to 42 percent. In another study, non-trauma centers were reported to less likely order head CTs by 9% for pediatric TBI patients, and non-teaching hospitals were 8% more likely to order them. So as you can see, there is a lot of variability in the imaging utilization in TBI patients. So now that we know that there's a lot of variability in imaging utilization, does it matter? And yes, it definitely does matter since variability in imaging utilization ultimately hurts patients and payers and winds up being a waste of our professional resources and talents. Inappropriate use of imaging can lead to misdiagnosis or delayed diagnosis, especially when imaging is underutilized, which in turn can lead to worse health outcomes and higher overall cost in healthcare spending. Inappropriate use of imaging can lead to unnecessary or excessive radiation exposure for patients when CT is being performed. It is considered that the U.S. could save $120 million annually in imaging cost alone if imaging utilization for mild traumatic brain injury adheres to clinical guidelines. So as healthcare providers, we need to appropriately utilize imaging so we can image the right patient with the right imaging test at the right time point. Therefore, the presence of a head is not a sufficient indication for a head CT in a patient who has suffered traumatic injury. There are several causes leading to variability in imaging utilization in TBI. A main cause is that no one has yet to synthesize the current research on TBI imaging in a form that can be easily accessed and employed at the point of care. And this can be utilized by emergency department physicians, internists, pediatricians, physiatrists, neuropsychologists, radiologists, and other TBI professionals working in this field. Here are two resources that can be used as a reference regarding the imaging evidence and recommendations for TBI published for conventional standard imaging as well as the more advanced neuroimaging applications. Both of these publications review and summarize the current evidence in the literature and provide updated imaging recommendations for healthcare providers. So I would like to now turn over the presentation to Dr. Jenna Lee. Thank you, Dr. Sinelli. Uh, I'm Jenna Lee. Um, so I'm just going to begin by going over the definitions of some of those terms that we'll be using over and over in the discussion that follows. So we often talk about TBI as being either mild, moderate, or severe. And what we mean by that is that some patients have more severe Glasgow Coma Scale scores than others. And we'll review the Glasgow Coma Scale or the GCS in greater depth uh, shortly. But for now, I'll just remind you that the scale 
from 3 to 15 that quantifies the severity of a patient's brain trauma based on clinical signs, with a lower score denoting a more severe injury. So uh, mild TBI is defined as a GCS score of 13 to 15. Moderate TBI is defined as a GCS score of 9 to 12. And severe TBI is defined as a GCS score of 3 to 8. Um, another way we classify TBI is on the basis of acuity. Uh, we call it TBI acute if the injury occurred within the past week. We call it chronic if it occurred three or more months ago. We call, we call it subacute if it occurred somewhere in between. Um, and finally, we define child, and the words child and adult in the normal way. We say a child is someone under 18 years of age and an adult is uh, anyone else. So uh, as promised, here's a slide about the Glasgow Coma Scale. So the GCS score is derived by adding together three separate subscores. Uh, one subscore having to do with eye movement, one having to do with the verbal ability, one having to do with motor ability. We assign between a one and four points for the eye movement, between a one and five points for the verbal ability, and between a one and six points for the motor ability. And a high score, with 15 of being the highest possible score, denotes a less clinically severe injury, while a low score, with three being the lowest possible, would denote a more severe injury. Um, so approaches to imaging are rated according to a classification system uh, that was adapted by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence from the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine. Um, and in this system, a class one recommendation is the one for which there's evidence indicating that the uh, stated course of action is beneficial to patients. A class 2A recommendation is the one for which there's conflicting evidence with a preponderance of evidence suggesting that the stated course of action is probably beneficial. A class 2B recommendation is one for which there's conflicting evidence and for which the, the, use, the, the usefulness of the stated course of action is less well established. And finally, a class 3 recommendation is the one for which the stated course of action has been shown not to be, to be not helpful or even possibly harmful to our patients. Um, but the American College of Radiology has an additional way of rating the appropriateness of different approaches to imaging. And this is based on a consensus of expert radiologists using the most up-to-date scientific data. And the ACR rates approaches to imaging on a scale of 1 to 9, where 1 to 3 means usually not appropriate, 4 to 6 means may be appropriate, and 7 to 9 means usually appropriate. So on this scale, a high score is a good score. Um, and the ACR appropriateness criteria for TBI can be accessed um, at the URL, the, the link that you see on your screen here. And it's important to keep in mind that uh, the ACR appropriateness criteria should be applied in conjunction with all the clinical information that's available. So here's just a brief example on how you might apply this. So let's say a patient presents with head trauma to your emergency department, and you're their emergency department physician. And you work them up and you suspect that they have a vascular injury based on the clinical findings. So in this situation, you might ask yourself, well, what imaging test should I order first? Should I order a, you know, a CTA of the head and neck contrast? Or would it be more appropriate in this specific clinical scenario to order a CT of the head with and without contrast in order to rule out vascular injury? So what you could do in this situation is we go to this link that we have here. and through that link, you could access the appropriateness criteria, which would tell you that CTA of the head and neck with contrast has an appropriateness rating of 8 for this specific clinical scenario, while the CT of the head with and without contrast would only have an appropriateness rating of 6. That would help you decide what's the most appropriate imaging test in your, in your uh, clinical situation. So the main objectives of TBI imaging are, are threefold. Uh, the first objective is that we want, we want to identify those patients who really need an emergent intervention, be it a neurosurgical intervention or some other kind of uh, interventional procedure. And on the side of your screen, you see a non-contrast uh, CT scan image of the head. And you see this very white uh, crescent-shaped collection of acute blood products in the right subdural space. And you see that's compressing the underlying brain, causing the midline structures to shift toward the left. And you see dilatation of the lateral ventricles, which is a sign of hydrocephalus. 
So this, this imaging would tell you that this patient is the one who needs emergent surgical decompression of their subdural hematoma. So that's one reason imaging is important in TBI. The second objective is to identify patients who would benefit from early medical therapy or from intensive surveillance. And the third uh, objective would be to determine the patient's prognosis so that you can optimize management, but also so that you could appropriately counsel the patient and his or her family as to what to expect. Uh, so first we'll talk about TBI in adults. And we'll begin by talking about TBI that both acute and either moderate to moderate or severe in the severity. And when patients in this group first present, the first line imaging test is a non-contrast head CT. This is a class one recommendation, and um, it's a recommendation that has the highest possible ACR appropriateness criteria rating, a rating of nine. And that's because uh, in this setting, non-contrast head CT is highly sensitive for things like hemorrhage, foreign body and skull fracture, and furthermore, it's highly predictive of mortality. Um, but uh, if the CT scan is normal and the symptoms persist, then a non-contrast MRI of the brain may be indicated. And uh, among other reasons, this is because MRI is more sensitive for diffuse external injury than a CT scan. You see two images on your screen. In the upper right-hand corner, you see a CT scan, a non-contrast CT scan of the brain, which is normal. And right underneath it, you see um, an image from an MRI of these same patients. Um, and here you see two dark spots uh, representing microhemorrhages in corpus callosum. And these are microhemorrhages that were not picked up by the CT scan. Um, so this example shows that MRI can be more sensitive for these kinds of injuries. However, it's important to keep in mind that um, at this point, there's not yet enough evidence to establish that whether the severity of MRI findings in BAI correlates with attribute severity or prognosis. That's just something to keep in mind. Um, when following up patients in this group, uh, the follow-up imaging test of choice is a non-contrast head CT. However, non-contrast MRI of the brain may be indicated as a follow-up test if the CT scan is normal and if the patient's symptoms persist. Uh, so now what about these patients who, uh, the adult patients who come in with acute, mild TBI? What do we do about them? Well, in fact, some patients in this group actually don't need any imaging at all. Um, and the way we identify those patients who don't need any, any imaging at all is we use a clinical decision rule test, such as the Canadian CT head rule, CHR for short, or the National Emergency X-ray Utilization Study, NEXUS 2 for short. Uh, so, for example, uh, the CCHR states that if an adult comes in with a blunt head trauma, a GCS score greater than 12, and no bleeding diapasis, that patient uh, can safely forego imaging if he meets all of these below criteria. If he's under age 65, if his mechanism of injury isn't one that, that was deemed dangerous, if he had fewer than two episodes of vomiting, and so on and so forth. Um, so. Adults with acute mild TBI who do need imaging should get a non-contrast head CT as their first line imaging test, just like the adults with a moderate to severe TBI. This is also a class one recommendation with an ACR appropriateness criteria rating of seven. And this is because in this setting, a uh, non-contrast head CT um, has a high negative predictive value for the need for surgical intervention. And in general, routine use of a uh, brain MRI in these patients is not recommended. However, uh, non-contrast MRI of the brain may be indicated if there are new persistent or worsening symptoms. When following up adults who present with acute mild TBI, routine use of follow-up imaging of any kind is actually not recommended if the initial CT scan was normal. However, follow-up with a repeat non-contrast head CT should be obtained if the patient has worsening symptoms or if the patient is on anticoagulation and did have an abnormality on their initial CT scan. And follow-up non-contrast brain MRI may be indicated if the CT scan is normal and there are persistent unexplained symptoms. So I'm now going to pass off the baton to Dr. Max Wintermark. Thank you, Jenna.
So um, to continue with this presentation, we need to address the situation of the pediatric population. And uh, the pediatric population is, of course, uh, of, um, is a special population because we want to be very careful in terms of what type of imaging we use in this population. And we are, of course, very concerned about the radiation risk. Um, the non-contrast head CT remains at this point the first line uh, imaging examination. However, there is a growing body of evidence showing that uh, clinical observation for certain duration can potentially represent an alternative to a head CT. Um, the, the role of MRI uh, is still being investigated. MRI, of course, presents a number of advantages, including the main one that it does not expose the patients to radiation, so it might be helpful in a number of situations. However, at this time, uh, research is still ongoing to, to clearly define the, the role uh, of MRI in that particular uh, population. Um, in terms of subacute and chronic TBI, so so far we have discussed with you um, all the different types of acute TBI, different severity and in different population. Now we, we turn to subacute and chronic TBI. And here I think that the, the, the key element is that it's the clinical presentation that guides the type of imaging that should be obtained. And uh, imaging should be obtained if the patient has new persistent symptoms. And those symptoms can be of different types. They can be cognitive symptoms. They can be neuropsychological symptoms. They can be somatic symptoms. And again, if uh, the, the patient who experienced a TBI in the past show those new persistent or worsening symptoms, then the examination of choice is a non-contrast brain MRI to try to better understand the underlying substrate for those uh, symptoms. Whoops. Um, a specific type of injury that can be observed in the setting of traumatic brain injury is a lesion or an injury to the vessels that supply blood flow to the, the brain. And there are some instances where the suspicion for such vascular injury should be raised. This situation includes the presence of a basilar skull fracture, the presence of a mandible fracture, any complex skull fracture, any cervical spine injury, or any penetrating neck injury. And in these settings, the type of studies that could be obtained are either CT angiograms or MR angiograms. Uh, CT angiograms always require the administration of dye or contrast. For MR angiograms, there are different ways to perform them, and some methods use uh, a contrast injection. Other methods do not require the injection of uh, contrast. To turn now to uh, advanced imaging, so of course, as we discussed uh, so far, while CT and MRI are excellent techniques when it comes to diagnosing uh, severe TBI and moderate TBI, uh, they have limitation when it comes to evaluating patients with mild traumatic brain injury. And more specifically, uh, they may underestimate the degree of injury. Sometimes they may even look uh, a non-contrast head CT or regular MRI may look completely normal in a patient who has sustained a traumatic brain injury. And so that's why at the, the current time, there are a number of advanced MRI imaging techniques that are being uh, investigated by researchers across the world to try to see if they can uh, perform better and if they can uh, increase the sensitivity of imaging in terms of detecting those mild traumatic brain injury. You have here a uh, a list, and this list includes techniques such as diffusion sensor imaging, functional imaging, spectroscopy, uh, as well as uh, different nuclear medicine uh, techniques such as positon emission tomography. 
As I uh, mentioned, all of those techniques are currently uh, heavily investigated. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of research results that are extremely interesting and extremely promising. Um, it is our hope that one day those techniques will become part of the routine uh, uh, imaging techniques that are available to assess those patients with mild traumatic brain injury. But one thing that is very important to remember is that at the current time when reviewing the evidence and the literature available, there's not sufficient evidence to uh, support the use uh, of those advanced imaging techniques in individual patients. And I think that's something that is really very important. You will be reading papers where they compare the group of patients with mild traumatic brain injury to a group of normal patients. And I'm going to report on some of those papers on my next slide. Uh, interesting differences have been found using those advanced imaging techniques between groups of patients with mild traumatic brain injury and groups of normal patients. But again, at the current time, the, the level of evidence that we have is not sufficient to extrapolate those group comparisons to individual uh, patients. And um, you know, one, one example that I can use to illustrate that point is diffusion sensor imaging. So for, for those who are not familiar with this technique, diffusion sensor imaging is a, an MRI technique that uh, is quite amazing. It allows to uh, look at the, the nerve fibers within the brain. And so you can see how the different regions of the brain are connected to, to each other uh, through those uh, nerve fibers, so it's an outstanding technique that can that has this high sensitivity and can detect how the different regions of the brain are connected together. There have been uh, imaging studies that have been performed to look at how this diffusion sensor imaging performs in patients with mild traumatic brain injury, and some interesting findings have been uh, found again when comparing groups of patients with mild traumatic brain injury with uh, groups of normal patients. But as illustrated with those two studies that are displayed on the slide, um, the results have sometimes been contradictory in the sense that depending on when you image the patient after the traumatic brain injury, you may see uh, different findings. So uh, shortly after or relatively shortly after the trauma, you may see some decreased connectivity, while uh, if you wait longer, you may see increased connectivity. So there are variations. So it's not that you can just find a finding and interpret it. You have to put it in, concept, in context. And the other thing also is that there's a lot of variation of the connectivity in individual patients based on other factors that have nothing to do with the traumatic brain injury. So the age of the patients, uh, their general risk factors, um, you know, all, all of those things, whether they have diabetes, hypertension, all of those factors basically influence the result of diffusion sensor imaging. And so as a result, again, while you can make group comparison and find very interesting findings, you have to uh, uh, use a lot of caution when you try to uh, apply those techniques to individual patients because, again, the, the findings that you observe may or may not relate to the traumatic brain injury. And that's why, again, at the current time, the literature doesn't support the use of these techniques uh, in uh, individual patients. Another type of uh, imaging that also has a lot of promise in the evaluation of patients with traumatic brain injury is positon emission tomography. So it's a completely different uh, imaging technique. Um, for PET, as we call it, you basically inject a radioactive imaging agent. And this agent basically travels in the body, reaches the brain, and in the brain basically can do different things depending on the agent that you are using. So we have one agent called FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose, that basically allows us to track the metabolism of the brain. But there are also newer agents that are able to look at other things that are able to track the inflammation in the brain or that are able to, to track different neurodegenerative 
uh, processes without the brain. So that's something that is extremely exciting. And again, in the setting of TBI, very interesting studies have been uh, conducted, um, which basically look at uh, different groups of patients and find uh, different, very interesting results in terms of the conventional FDG, the fluor deoxyglucose marker of the brain metabolism, or those new markers that are becoming available. But again, same thing, same caution that you need to apply as when we discuss DTI. There are, for instance, if we take the example of the FDG PET, there are a number of things that can influence your, your brain metabolism. One of the simple things is whether you drink coffee in the morning or not, that can have some influence on your brain metabolism. And so as a result, again, you have to apply caution when you see changes in individual patients because, again, they may or they may not relate to the traumatic uh, brain injury. So again, a, a very interesting field of research. Again, some uh, very significant progress has been made over the past few years, and hopefully some very significant progress will also be made in the years to come. And hopefully at some point we will be able to apply those techniques for individual patients. But again, that's not the case today considering the, the literature and the evidence that is available. So it was a great pleasure to participate to this webinar. And now we are very happy to um, try and answer some of your uh, questions. And Laura is going to take uh, over um, the podium again. Yeah, hi, thanks everyone. So uh, I, I thanks to all our presenters for a great presentation there. So a couple of things for um, for the audience. The first is if, if you would just type any questions that you have into the, the question box on your um, on your screen, then um, we're, we're going to read out the questions that way. Um, and then the other thing is there, there's been a couple of questions already about you know wh whether or not you're going to have access to these slides. And we are going to send you a PDF of the slides, and then we'll also post the presentation on the on the Head Injury Institute um, webpage. Okay, so, so coming in um, is, here's a question about the appropriateness criteria. So the question is, um, uh, the ACR appropriateness criteria for head trauma variant 4 um, for, for PET-CT has a rating of 4, indicating that it may be appropriate. But in your white paper um, uh, and in this presentation, you say that it's not really ready for the individual patient. So the question is, is there, is there a discrepancy between um, what you're saying and, and the ACRAC? So this is Max Wintermark. I'm happy to take this question. So perhaps a, a couple of uh, background points before I answer the question itself. So uh, as Jenna mentioned in a part of the presentation, um, the ACR appropriateness criteria uh, are a tool, a set of tools that are available uh, for um, all the people involving in ordering uh, or performing imaging tests in patients to try to decide what imaging test is the most uh, appropriate. Um, the, in the appropriateness criteria, different scenarios basically are proposed for a particular condition, for instance, for traumatic brain injury. And then basically uh, there's a rating that is proposed for the different uh, tests available. And uh, it basically indicates which test would be preferable um, to um, uh, uh, another test. It also reports about the radiation risk that is, that is associated with each of those tests. Uh, in terms of how the appropriateness criteria are developed it's a very systematic uh, process that uh, involves a, a large number of experts, and they continuously review the literature to update those appropriateness criteria and uh, try to um, develop also, um, you know, the, the appropriate uh, imaging pathway for patients with different conditions. Um, when we reviewed the literature and when we wrote the two papers that basically were the backbone of the webinar that we 
we we gave today we made uh, a lot of effort for uh, aligning our recommendations with uh, the, the 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 recommendation included in the appropriateness criteria and, and I think also kind of so that was kind of the first thing I wanted to say the second thing I wanted to say is also that you know guidelines are always guidelines and uh, of course you have always to you know, uh, you guys on the webinar are taking care of patients. Each patient is a, in, an individual with a specific history, a specific presentation, specific symptoms and signs. And so you should always um, use those gu guidelines as a tool to make the best decision. But of course, the, the guidelines need to be interpreted so that you make the appropriate decision for the one patient that you are taking care of. And um, to, to now come to the question, I, I think that I would need to review exactly the scenario that has been used and where this grading for the, the PET was described uh, as what you said, Laura. So because I think, again, uh, that's the key for those appropriateness criteria, uh, the, 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 you know, there are specific scenarios. So we need to review exactly what the, the scenario is. And, and I think, again, that you know, it would, for instance, I, I cannot remember in the scenario that is proposed if they are, if the patient is having new symptoms or not, which would influence a little bit the level of appropriateness of uh, the study. And I think that the, the important thing to, to keep in mind is what I mentioned during the, uh, when we discussed PET, is again the fact that there are other things than TBI that can influence the result of the test. And so as a result, you know, if you see a change, um, you have to wonder what caused the change. And again, there are a lot of things that can influence the PET results. There are a lot of things that have nothing to do with the TBI that can influence the PET results. And, you know, I mentioned one example, which is, uh, you know, drinking a cup of coffee before you get your, your PET exam. And so and, and that's just one amongst a, a long list of things that can influence the results. So I think that there's definitely some caution that needs to be applied when you interpret the results of, of a PET study. Pina or Jenna, is there anything that you would like to add? Yes, I'd just like to add and really underscore what you have already said, Max, in that although our paper may have reviewed the evidence in the literature and did not have sufficient supportive evidence to demonstrate that some of the advanced neuroimaging techniques, and I'm not going to be specific to PET but to others as well, would not shown to have sufficient evidence to support use on a population basis. However, as you stated, when you're treating an individual patient, if you find that they're in your judgment that there is a clinical benefit to performing an advanced imaging exam, then it very well may be warranted. So a lot of the evidence that was reviewed was based for population recommendations and not necessarily um, can be translated as easily to in individual patients because as Max has stated, there are many other factors that you may want to consider in assessing that patient. And that's where our healthcare provider judgment comes in as to whether or not another study or a more advanced study could be beneficial to the patient. I hope that answers the question or clears it up, not only for PET, but for some of the other advanced neuroimaging. And, and perhaps just to add one thing on that, when Dr. Sanelli discussed about population-based recommendation, the idea is basically it's, there are some tests that you should not obtain systematically in every single of your patient because probably that it will be hard to, to come up with any kind of interpretation. Now, that doesn't say that, again, in one specific patient, there's not an indication for that test. Right. All right, thank you, Max and Pina. And uh, uh, some more questions coming in. Next question, um, how difficult is it to implement uh, uh, DTI? So I'm also happy to um, uh, take this question. So the, the difficulty with uh, DTI is that it's not one single uh, imaging technique. Uh, it includes a number of variants. It's like, you know, when you treat a patient with an infection, you just don't give antibiotics. 
you have to decide what type of antibiotics you are going to use for the particular infection that the patient is having. So same thing for DTI. DTI is a generic name, but there are actually a, a large number of techniques that can be used um, to perform DTI. And that's part of the difficulties, again, that you may doing something that is called DTI, but if it's not the same DTI technique as the one that is used in the paper that you read, the, the results may not translate. So there are multiple ways of uh, doing DTI. Usually, um, when you have an MRI scanner, the, the manufacturer of the MRI scanner uh, usually offers a support of the the, the tools available on the MRI scanner, a DTI sequence. And I think that really the important thing is to try to really understand very well the tool that that particular scanner offers and how it compares to the tools that have been used in the papers published in the literature. For DTI, the other thing I want to add is that one thing is to uh, acquire the, the data, acquire the images while the patient is in the scanner. And as we discussed, there's a little bit of variability there. The other thing is once you have the data, once you have the imaging data, you need then some kind of software, some kind of processing software to basically extract the meaningful information from the data that you have acquired. And same thing here. Again, uh, there are multiple software packages that are available uh, out there and they do different things. So also uh, another word of caution, again, uh, the, 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 it's not just good enough to do DTI, like it's not just enough to give antibiotics for an infection. You need to know what type of DTI the, the scanner or the, the colleague that you're working with is doing so that you can put that in perspective when you, you read articles in the, in the literature. Uh, again, Pinar, Jen, I don't know if you have anything you would like to add. Yeah, I just also would just like to add that when you're performing advanced imaging, you know, especially DTI, that it is really helpful to have a knowledgeable physicist on hand to assist you in that, as well as if you're a um, non-radiology healthcare provider working with your um, board-certified neuroradiologist and making sure that you're obtaining the best quality images as well as the optimal quantitative data so that your interpretations are accurate. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wintermark and Dr. Sinelli. So uh, a next question is uh, whether or not, is, is there any indication for a CT with IV contrast in acute TBI, not, not CTA? Right, I'm happy to start this one and then Max and Jenna can add in. Um, so aside from using contrast for angiography techniques to visualize the vessels, because that is very helpful in traumatic brain injury, off the top of my head, the standard of care is to do non-contrast CT, mostly because it is very quick and efficient way of scanning. and most of what we're looking for in brain injury um, with acute blood products are hyperdense or bright on non-contrast imaging. So there's very little clinical need I can see right now using contrast imaging. There may be exceptions where a radiologist or neuroradiologist reviews a non-contrast head CT and indicates that contrast could be helpful in maybe further defining um, an abnormality or further defining something in the subdural space where sometimes giving contrast can bring out that abnormality better. Um, Max or Jenna, do you have anything you can add? No, I, I agree again. So as you said, vascular, suspicion of vascular injury would warrant the injection of contrast. But other, otherwise, in the large majority of the cases, the non-contrast head CT is sufficient with, again, exceptions on an individual basis depending on what you see on the non-contrast head CT. Um, yeah, I agree with the, what Dr. Wintermark and Dr. Sinelli are saying. Um, you know, often there are clinical scenarios where you are interested in multiple body parts at the same time, so you want to scan the 
chest with a contrast because we want to rule out some sort of vascular injury there. It, even then, it's better just gener generally speaking to start with, you know, to do the non-contrast head CT first because the contrast may obscure hemorrhage. That's, that's the most important consideration. Great, thank you. Um, okay, next question. Can you tell us some of the ways um, describing uh, diffuse axonal injury, shear injuries on MRI results in clinical management changes or prognosis? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear the whole thing. Can you say that again? Can you describe how uh, describing shear injuries on an MRI result uh, can can result in clinical management changes. So well, I don't. To, it, oh, well, you, Pina, okay. go ahead. Yeah, Max, I'm happy to start, and again, uh, you yeah. and Jenny can add in. So, you know, I would just caution in general using any specific imaging findings to alone determine management treatment decisions. Um, so when we talk specifically about diffuse axonal injury or shear injury, the imaging findings alone don't necessarily determine management treatment decisions. Those decisions are made in conjunction with the patient's um, thorough physical exam, specifically with neurologic testing, neurocognitive and neuropsychologic testing as well. Um, so the imaging findings alone um, are made, are used to look at other factors as well as how the patient is doing basically clinical symptoms or f clinical effects on the patient before making any management or treatment decisions. Yeah, and I, I completely agree. I, I think that the, the imaging, as Dr. Sanelli mentioned, is part, is a component of the evaluation of those uh, patients, uh, but it's not the only part, it's not the only component, and it needs to always be um, integrated together with these other pieces of information which are very important. And I think that Jen also mentioned in our portion of the presentation that there have been studies um, that illustrate that point very well, because if you just look at, again, um, you know, the findings on MRI that are associated with diffuse axonal injuries, such as, for instance, microbleeds, it has been demonstrated that the number of microbleeds does not necessarily correlate uh, very well with outcome because, again, it's more complicated than that. There are many other factors that are involved, and so, again, you should be uh, careful. You know, again, the imaging brings some additional information that uh, the clinician taking care of the patient will use. But again, then the, the clinician will be in the best position to, to put all those pieces of information together and determine what's the best treatment for the patient and what's the likely outcome for the patient. Um, yes, I, I agree with everything that Dr. Snelly and Dr. Wintermark are saying. Um, you know, if the patient has symptoms completely otherwise unexplained, then it may be helpful to get further imaging that might show those diffuse external injuries. But again, just because the MRI appears to show a heavy disease burden with a lot of microhemorrhage. If the patient is clinically doing very well, that might not necessarily lead to a treatment change. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is, um, what is the diagnostic blood test S100B actually measuring? I'm also happy to start with this one. So. Um, one area of uh, very active research uh, um, is to look at blood biomarkers. So we talked a lot during that webinar about imaging, but there are definitely other diagnostic tests that are uh, helpful. And so one type of diagnostic test that is being uh, actively investigated is to look if there are in your blood, in the blood of the patients, any markers that could be used to diagnose traumatic brain injury. Would that be, again, that if there was a, a, an easy blood test that you could do that would allow you to diagnose traumatic brain injury, it would be extremely helpful. All those imaging tests that we discussed, CAT scan, MRI, you need a 
a CT scanner. You need an MRI scanner. It's not something that can be done uh, on the field. Uh, it's not something that can be done where the, the trauma is, is happening. And so again, if there was a, a blood test available, that's something that could be done on the field. That could be done where the trauma is happening. And so, so there, there's a, 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 that's an area of active investigation. And so the, the, the protein S100B is one of those blood biomarkers that um, is considered as a very good candidate uh, to, to be able to diagnose TBI, uh, you know, again, through a blood draw. It's something that is used actively in a couple of uh, European countries and something that is currently being, again, investigated in the United States and, and considered by the, the FDA. And I just want to add that although, it, 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 as Max has described, the S100B is a serum biomarker that is, you know, adds a lot of promise to diagnosing TBI in the field as well, which is at the point of care, which is very important, um, but it is not widely used in clinical practice today. And it's not FDA approved. Right. And uh, while, while the S100B is you know, if, it, if the levels are completely normal, that can tell you something about the patient. But if the levels are elevated, uh, it's, not very, it's not necessarily very specific for, uh, for brain trauma. Other things can cause elevations in S100B levels. Uh, various neurodegenerative diseases, epilepsy, there, there, there are various other conditions that could also raise the S100B levels. So um, that, that has to be taken into account clinically. Great. Thank you all. Uh, so the so next question is, is about reimbursement and whether or not there's an issue with reimbursement in, in cases where you use a non-contrast MR instead of a non-contrast CT um, as a first line, such as in the case of pediatric patients. And I'm happy again to try to answer. So it's a difficult question. I'm not sure that I, I know uh, the answer um, exactly. I think that there, you know, there, the, those questions of reimbursements are complicated because the, the coverage rule can vary from one uh, geographic region to the other. They can also vary from one ins insurance carrier to the other. So, so again, I think that uh, I'm going to say something, but use it with a lot of caution, and you should probably check with the billing people at your own uh, institution to have the final uh, answer. Um, I, I would think, again, that as we, we discussed, typically CT is the first line uh, in terms of the evaluation of a pediatric patient in the acute setting. We saw also that sometimes by just observing uh, the patient um, uh, you know, that can be just good enough if you can observe them uh, long enough. Uh, uh, MRI is definitely an option. And, um, you know, especially in the emergency setting, uh, the, the physician in charge of the patient makes the decision in terms of uh, what the best test is. So I would think that if based on the physical examination, the determination, and, you know, and also the discussion with the parents, the determination is that the the best test to obtain would be uh, an MRI. That's probably something that can be uh, obtained. But again, I, I would think that that's something that would need to be checked at each individual institution because, again, the, the coverage rule may vary. One thing also, and perhaps I will be curious to hear what uh, Pina and Jenna think about it. You, you know, with those imaging tests, you also have to be a little bit cautious because, again, the, the value of those tests has, has not been very well established, and you also have to think of the possibility of finding things that, finding uh, some imaging findings on those tests, and, and, and then they, they basically create a diagnosis dilemma where you don't know exactly what to do with them. And so that, that's also something that you also need to, to always keep in mind is that's the danger with those tools that are very a sensitive issue, if you obtain them and you find something, you may be, uh, you know, in, in a bind in terms of what to do with this imaging finding. Pina and Jenna, do you want to comment more on that? Sure. Um, I, you know, first of all, I agree with what Max had said regarding that 
coverage decisions for imaging examinations do vary geographically um, as well as by private insurance payers. And, you know, I think ultimately if the physician responsible and caring for the patient indicates that MRI is a first line and is better, there may be clinical indications to support that where coverage may be, um, um, you know, appropriate. So again, you know, I think that that's just a variable question right now um, regarding MRI coverage as first line. Regarding the scenario that Max brought up about, um, I'm sorry, I'm just blanking specifically, Max, you were asking. Well, just, you know, findings on the MRI, well, you know, like you, you do an MRI in a pediatric patient and you find a right. small microbleed. Right, right. So there's the issue of incidental findings which are unrelated to why you're imaging the patient and then subclinical findings that you may find, which is I think what you're referring to is that when you see something that could be related to traumatic brain injury, but it could be subclinical in that the patient doesn't have any um, clinical symptoms or signs related to that imaging finding, then what do you do with that? Because it really turns out to be then an imaging finding without any clinical symptoms. And so depending on what that finding is and how large it is, you know, I think that a lot of places are following them up. So maybe following them to resolution or going back and doing a more thorough physical exam with, again, specific neurocognitive and neuropsychological evaluation. Um, but yes, I think that once you see something on the imaging, even if it is subclinical finding, you will have to either go back and really do a more thorough evaluation of the patient and or possibly follow up imaging to make sure that that finding doesn't worsen or progress and that it actually gets better and resolves over time. Great, thank you. So we have two minutes left and, and just uh, one more question I, I think we have time for really quickly. So the last question is, could you please discuss the role of GRE versus SWI? So, so I'm um, happy to, yeah. oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, it's okay, go ahead. So GRE and SWI are two MRI sequences. So, so one stands for gradient echo and the other one stands for susceptibility weighted imaging. Um, they, they kind of do the same thing in the sense that they are all very, some, those two sequences are very sensitive to the detection of small amount of blood. And so the, the goal of using the two sequences uh, is the same. Um, SWI is even more sensitive than uh, um, GRE, which is kind of good and bad because on the one hand you can detect more lesions potentially, but on the other hand you also um, have a lot of artifacts, for instance, from the blood vessels, so sometimes the lesions are so harder to detect. Um, also, as we mentioned earlier, the, the number of microbleeds is not correlated with the outcome. So in some ways, if you detect uh, three with the GRE and four with the susceptibility weighted imaging, it doesn't necessarily have any kind of practical clinical implications. And, and I think also what you have to realize is that depending on the scanner that you are using, you may be able to do one or the other or both. And so I think, in my mind, I see them mostly as equivalent tool, uh, and you can get one or the other, and you can extract the same type of information uh, from both uh, of, uh, of them. So uh, I don't know, if Pina, Jenna, you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I just agree with what Max says, the susceptibility way the imaging is a more sensitive sequence for detection of um, hemorrhage and also iron deposition in general. Um, however, is it clinically more useful um, remains to be seen. 
All right. Well, I, I think that's we're out of time here. So I appreciate everyone who joined uh, the webinar. Thank you, and you know we, we hope to have more of these in the future. So so look out for those. And I appreciate your joining. And thank you to our presenters as well. Um, and and then once again, the webinars uh, will be available on the website, and we will uh, send out a, a PDF of the slides. Thank you so much.